an alternative method for dealing with collisions is going to be open address hashing. The idea here is if we have a hash table with various locations, and some of those locations are occupied, Let's say we wanted to insert something into the table and we hit a location that was already occupied. What we're going to do is we're going to do some sort of mathematical operation and find a new location and insert the element at that new location instead. So that is the idea behind open address hashing. How can we do this? Well, we're going to modify our hash function to take two inputs the key and the number of times that we needed to rehash. So here, let's go through this code a little bit. We're going to say we're going to start with this rehashing variable being zero, and we're going to keep rehashing it until we find an open location. So we have a repeat until we've seen this before. We're going to say the location that we are hashing to is I of H of K comma J. This is because we want to be able to rehash this. If the location we compute that at location i is empty, we just add it. If it's not empty, we're going to rehash it. So we're going to increment this variable. And then we're going to try again and again and again until we run out of locations in the table. If we run out of locations, we're going to throw an error of hash table overflow. And that will let the user know that there's no hope of inserting anything into the ha this hash table because we have overflowed it. Having said that, let's discuss a couple of ideas for what this hash function might look like. H of K J might look like A K plus C times J mod M. This is what you might call linear hashing. What you could also do is H k j is equal to some hash function h1 of k plus j mod m what this does is it will linearly search every location after the current one that you have checked that seems like a somewhat reasonable guess but if you had regular patterns maybe you would get a problem where you continually need to search lots of locations so it might not be a good idea alternative ones might be h of k j is equal to h1 of k plus c1j plus c2j squared mod m. That's quadratic caching. You could also even get more sophisticated and just abstract everything away and say h1 of k plus h2 of j. So you use a hash function on j as well and hope that as you increase j by 1, if that hash function h2 was a good choice, it will give you very different values as you rehash. So with that in mind, our natural question might be, what is the expected number of collisions? So the expected number of collisions is how many times is hi not empty on that line? So let's try and analyze that. We're going to begin, as we did with our previous example, by defining some variables to say what we mean. So we're going to define or let y equal the number of times hi is not empty uh, in step five of our methods. Let's scroll up and verify that I didn't lie to you. In step five, we are always checking whether or not the location matches the key. So we're doing this for insertion, but for all the methods, it will be the same. So let us first say I sub j is equal to h of k j. This lets us say what is the jth value that we get when we're continually rehashing here. So i0 is our first attempt at hashing. So we want to know what is the probability 
that h at location i0 is not empty. So what is our probability here? Let's again define what we mean by our notions of size somewhere. Let's say m is the size of the table and n is the number of elements. If I have a hash table of size m and I've inserted n elements and this hash function is chosen intelligently so that all locations are equally likely, the, what we have here is that there are n locations that are occupied out of m total places. So if we had 10 locations occupied out of 15 total locations, this would be 10 fifteenths would be the chance that we hit one of those locations. This is making a similar assumption to what we did before, that every single hash function we have is well chosen enough that all locations are equally likely. This is sometimes called alpha, which is the load factor. We will briefly discuss that at the end as well. So that's not too bad. So let's discuss the probability that h i zero and h i one are not empty. Well, in order for that to be true, h i one had to be empty. And we needed that h i2 would not be empty, which there would be n minus 1 locations if I never rehashed the same location again. And there are m minus 1 possibilities. This is making the assumption that we never are going to reach that first location again, which if you chose a good method will never happen. And this should start to already look familiar. We saw something with nearly identical symbology appear when we were doing one of our gambling problems. The one that had a bunch of uh, balls in a bucket and we were pulling them out. What we're going to do here is bound this above by n over m squared. Now, let's continue the process. What is the probability that h i 0, h i 1 and h i 2 are not empty? Well, that will be that the first one isn't empty, and that the second one isn't empty, and that the third one isn't empty, which is less than or equal to, you guessed it, n over m quantity cubed. And now we want to know how to generalize this. Let's say that we want to know the probability that h i 0 up until h i of k minus 1 are not empty. Well, this probability is going to equal n over m times n minus 1 over m minus 1 all the way down until n minus k minus 1 and m minus k minus 1. And you bet we're going to do the exact same bound above. We have n over m to the k. Notice I chose k minus 1 just so I had a nice power over there. I could have also done a similar notation over here with k and then had k plus 1 on the right-hand side. Both are totally reasonable approaches to what's happening here. Note that we have something very familiar here by what we did in that previous problem. This familiarity is that this first line here is actually the probability that y is greater than or equal to 1. The probability that the number of times that we needed to execute that line, the number of times that hi wasn't empty, is greater than or equal to 1. That is exactly what we want to do some nice probability. So this is less than or equal to n over m. It happens to be equal to it, but just to really drive home the point. Similarly, if I had the probability that y is greater than or equal to q for any value q, this would be less than or equal to n over m to the q. And why is this true? It's true because that's exactly the thing I said in the last line there. So now, if we want to know the expected value of y, it is equal to the sum from q equals 1 to m of the probability 
that y is greater than or equal to q. Why does it only go to m? Well, my loop only goes as high as m. The most times this could possibly execute is m. And we've already sort of given up hope on computing this, so it's bounded above. This is less than or equal to the sum from q equals 1 to m of n over m to the q using our bound we have right above. And now what we're also going to do is further expand this to the sum from q equals 1 to infinity of n over m to the q, which is equal to, you might remember that for a geometric series, if it doesn't start at 0, it is the first term of the series over 1 minus the common ratio, and the first term of that series happens to be n over m. I don't know about you, but when I look at this as a complexity, I start to panic a little bit. That looks very unhelpful. So what I'm going to do actually is we're going to make another assumption. Let's assume that n is less than or equal to m over 2. That is that we never have occupied more than half of the table. With that assumption in mind, what we can say is that n over m is less than or equal to 1 half. And therefore, our expected value of y is less than or equal to plug in my bound for n over m and we get 1 half over 1 minus a half which is just equal to 2 and how can I use this to compute my runtime well the expected time as a function of both n and m is less than or equal to let's scroll up and actually look at the code now we now have sort of all the stuff we need we understand that one line that's complicated and everything else looked pretty straightforward so let's scroll up looking at the code we have constant time operation constant time operation constant time operation constant time operation everything takes constant time and it will take an additional time for each time that hi is an empty so our runtime is c times the expected value of y plus c and i know that this is actually an equality and then it's less than or equal to c times the expected value of y is less than or equal to 2 plus c which is equal to 3c and therefore we have that the expected time is in theta of 1. now let's go up and actually look at the code and maybe analyze the best and worst cases for this first function, the best case is no collision at all. That's clearly in theta of 1. Our expected case we just analyzed, and under our assumption it was in theta of 1. And our worst case is that we need to search through every single thing in the hash table, and that the hash table is completely full. Therefore, the worst case would be theta of n, or theta of m if you're talking about the size of the hash table. In the worst case, those would be identical. And if we look at the actual code, what we're doing is we are rehashing, and then if the thing is empty, we're inserting it. The only difference between any of these methods is rather than saying, is the thing empty, what we're doing is, is the thing at that location equal to a key, and is the thing at that location equal to a key. There really is no other difference between any of our methods, our insert, our member, and our retrieve functions. Therefore, all of them have the exact same complexity. So we have the same complexity for all three of these, which is nice because that means we don't have much to memorize. <laughs>